Hey everyone, welcome back to Realms Remembered. This is Michael T. Bradley with you once again. Alright, so before we go into the reviews this time, a little bit of theory behind this. If you're like me, and you're into a lot of genre fiction, uh, especially D&D fiction, things like that, you'll find a lot of times people will say on reviews, a fun read, or the absolute most annoying comment ever, it's not Shakespeare, but... Well, I don't want Shakespeare. I happen to think most Shakespeare is crap, and uh, I'm sure most of you out there will agree. I've never understood why certain things are considered great literature. I'm incredibly well-read, had uh, the equivalent of an English degree in college, um, have been an avid reader since, uh, oh man, probably eight or so? Probably before that. I remember I was reading Stephen King's The Stand in fifth grade, so if that gives you any idea of like what sort of reading level I've been at. And I still think Shakespeare is vastly overrated and kind of crap most of the time. If you can see him really well acted out, then it's worth it and blah, 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 blah. And I happen to actually really enjoy Hamlet. But beyond that, on a similar note, uh, I remember reading um, Great Gatsby and thinking, why is this considered great literature? Like, it wasn't a bad read by uh, any stretch of the imagination, but I didn't get much out of it. And uh, there was one good scene in it. The rest of it just kind of, eh. A lot of great literature feels that way. Like, people seem to revere it simply because it's important. And beyond that, like, for instance, Faulkner. I absolutely love Faulkner, but I can give you reasons why, not just because he's a good writer. Like, I love how vague, ambivalent, and open-ended motivations are at times, and murky. Um, it feels much more realistic for that, because you have to figure out yourself, why the hell is somebody acting this way? Now, I can understand why that wouldn't appeal to everyone, and I can totally get why people might not want to read book after book after book about, God, the South is really horrible. But for me, I enjoy that. If you haven't read The Sound and the Fury, well, uh, probably don't. <laughs> But if you're like me and you love a challenge, you might dig it. For the same reason I've always kind of wanted to read Infinite Jest, people have told me that if you enjoy a challenge when you open up a book, you will really uh, like that by David Foster Wallace. So all this is leading up to the point that uh, when it comes to genre fiction, I think it too easily gets dismissed as either a fun read <laughs> or, um, eh, it's crap, as if that's kind of the expected answer for genre fiction. So what I've always been interested in is intelligent, lengthy reviews uh, about things like this, because I don't care what book you're writing. If you're writing a book, it is a long, solitary process with very few thanks at the end, and possibly only your editor is the only one who's ever going to give you real feedback. It is a difficult process, and one that you just can't start on unless you feel something for it. Now I'm sure there are plenty of people out there who have done it for the money and nothing else, but I have to believe they are the minority. And when you're dealing with a, a shared world like Forgotten Realms especially, it has specific rules you have to follow. I mean, this isn't just something you can go in and toss out something half-heartedly and be done with it. Like, for instance, as I've said before, I don't like Ed Greenwood's stuff, I, I, I don't like his style, but I've tried to give reasons why, and I don't dismiss it as, eh, he's just churning out crap that he doesn't care about. So, I hope that you, like me, are invested in this enough that you're curious about um, detailed reviews. And I really hope that people who've actually read the stuff that I'm kind of skipping over, that I don't enjoy, will chime in at some point and give detailed descriptions. Try to try to make me interested in it. If you can get me to read uh, Lane Cunningham or Ed Greenwood, then you, sir, deserve some sort of medal. So let's see, let's, uh, let's go ahead and cover a couple more that uh, I'm skipping just to get them out of the way. 1345, we've got uh, Darkwalker on Moonshay, the first of that trilogy. I thought the uh, plot sounded interesting, and I liked druids, so I gave it a shot, and wow, I couldn't even make it through a chapter. It was weird. It was like Douglas Niles does this weird, uh, like he's mixing... The dialogue felt like a children's book, like really simplistic and overdone, like, hello, top of the morning to you, and uh, uh, things like that, like just... You know, I don't I don't need dialogue that's like sounds absolutely real to your ear, but this just sounded forced and um children's booky. Then mixed with like almost travelogue descriptions of boring crap, like just uh describing like the the valley or the, the uh uh pasture or whatever near where the main character was walking in these overly detailed, unnecessary stuff, especially at the beginning of your book. Um you know, uh, he, he walked through a field by a farmer's market. Done. 
you know, you're, you're done there. And for some reason, just kept going on and on and on. Then mixed with the childish dialogue, it just, I could not get interested at all. I don't even, I, I don't remember anything about the character who was introduced. It, it could be that it gets much better later on, but because I just was wham, stonewalled there from the beginning, skipping that, as well as the rest of the trilogy, Black Wizards and Darkwell, both of which take place in 1346. Not going to go on for a really long time, just going to cover one other book, and that is Exile, that goes from 1338 to 1340. Okay, so, as I've said before, I'm not a big Salvatore fan. This, I don't think this epitomizes why, but this is another kind of uh, nail in the coffin. Very much skin, this book. Here's my problem. So, in Homeland, at one point in it, uh, uh, Drizzt and a, a braiding party go out to the uh, top side. They go to the outside world where the sun shines and everything, and everybody else is like, oh, the accursed ball in the sky, and Drizzt is like, God, this feels wonderful. I finally feel at home. I feel peaceful here. This is awesome, and... I feel bad we're killing all these elf children and stuff, and um, I want to know more about these people, and da 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 And so the end of Homeland is Drizzt going, sweet, I have finally cut off, well, not sweet, I mean, things are kind of sad for him at that point, but, you know, the upside is sweet. I've left Mezzamazabrazabrazabazabazam behind, and me and Guaravar are going to go start our journey, and uh, things are going to be great. So, next book opens up, I'm fully expecting he's going to be topside. I mean, that's where he wanted to be, that's where he felt at home. The Underdark has nothing to offer him except drow and scary things. So, second book opens up, it's ten years later, and we're still in the damn Underdark. Why? Why? Everything about this book just felt like filler. It just felt like Salvatore was like, well, crap, he's, and I don't even know, I, I could check the dates, but I don't know, like 60 or something when Crystal Shard began, because of course he wrote these later to fill in Driz's early years. You know, it, it really felt like he was like, well, crap, it doesn't make sense that he would stick around men's bazarazam, 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 uh, past like 30 or so, so I've got to get him out of there then. But he can't just be wandering the topside world for 30 more years, so I've got to fill that time in, so let's put him in the Underdark. It, it really felt like that. Like, uh, it just didn't, it just, it did not feel a natural character progression. So for some reason, he's just down there killing Rothy and living off the land for 10 years. And then he's finally like, man, I should make friends or something. So I'm like, okay, here's where he goes topside. No, he goes and makes friends with the Spurred Bilftum or whatever it is. The, uh, uh, what are they, like gnomes or dwarves? Uh, the Dwargar are, are dwarves, so I assume they're gnomes. Anyway, you know, they, they live down there, and he, he becomes buddies with one of them, and then he become, they become buddies with a hook horror of all things. Clacker, who's like oddly one of the most interesting characters I've ever seen, and I wish there were more done with him than there is, because I, I probably would have liked that a lot, but, you know, whatever. I mean, he does some cool things with him. And I was actually kind of shocked that at the end of the book, both of them didn't die. I assumed everybody he met here was going to die before he finally went to the outside world, but I was a little shocked that that didn't happen, so that was a nice thing. Also, an another thing I was happy about was, oh, well, at least we're leaving Menza Bazarazarazim behind. Well, about half of the book is, is uh, Matron Malice, his ultimate foe from the first book, coming back and bothering him, and bringing back this character from the first book who was really interesting, and actually I liked more than anything else, just to be a, uh, like a death shade that attempts to kill Drizzt, and it just, it was like, really, why did we need this? Like, didn't we say everything we needed to say with this character in the first book? And I think we did. I, I don't think there was anything new done with that. The only reason I could see for him being in there was kind of to give Drizzt one more reason to be sad overall, or whatever, so that didn't gel for me. But... A lot of people like these books, so, you know, hey. And I've, I've started reading on uh, Sojourn a little bit, and it looks to be a bit more interesting because we do finally get outside, so yay! I read Crystal Shard years and years and years ago, and I actually enjoyed that. Uh, then I, I tried reading the sequel, which is, what is it, The Halfling's Gem, or is that part three? I don't know, it doesn't matter. I read the, started reading the sequel to that, and it just didn't work for me for reasons I'll get into once we actually get into it. But w my point here is simply that I, I have liked Salvatore's writing. That's why I keep skimming these rather than skipping them all together, because I want to give them a chance, and I really want to like them. Yeah, so we're at a point where I'm really going to have to kind of buckle down and do a lot of reading, which is difficult right now because I'm really busy. However, I can at least uh, get out one more of these fairly quickly, I hope. Hope you're all enjoying this. Thank you for listening, and as always, the link 
for the page where I'm getting this chronology from is going to be in the comments section, and you are welcome to comment and leave me feedback. Video feedback would be awesome. I'm really curious to hear what you guys think. Thanks for listening. This is Michael T. Bradley. Goodbye.